Oh, I'm spoiled at the moment. Such fantastic guests. So this is, um, this one, this interview is with Dr. Sarah Pugh. Sarah is wonderful. She is just so knowledgeable in so many areas. The whole quantum thing, I mean, she's got the diet thing nailed. She understands all of that stuff. But, you know, the 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 depth that she's gone into the whole quantum thing, the light, water and magnetism. And we went into so many aspects of that. So enjoy that. I mean, this 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 chat, uh, brilliant. She's she's wonderful. She's so much fun as well. So I um, I'd like to say that if anybody's watching this before the 20th of January um, 2024, Please have a look below and book for our War on Health conference. We've got, I'm speaking, Ben speaking, Ben Hunt, who I do the Big Fat Challenge with. But this is why I've done this last two, last three um, podcasts, because Sarah is one of the speakers. And so is so is Rachel Brown, Dr. Rachel Brown. And I just did a podcast with her. That was uh, the one before. Oh, no, the one before actually was uh, one before. This one was uh, with Dr. Ahmad Malik, who is so lovely. He's all heart. He's absolutely wonderful. And he's speaking too. But if you want to hear them uncensored, if you want to hear them in person, it's not being recorded. It's not being streamed. And uh, Sarah will be there totally uncensored, which uh, is, uh, I'm quite excited to see because she's fun enough when she's even a bit censored. So, um, yeah, that link will be below, as will Sarah's links. And please enjoy this wonderful podcast with Dr. Sarah Pugh. Right, welcome back, everybody, to the Red Pill Buddhist podcast. And um, I, th this is brilliant. I've got so many questions. I've got Dr. Sarah Pugh here. And I'm not going to go through her millions of qualifications. Uh, just check out the bio or something. But absolutely brilliant in so many areas. And I'm really excited to chat to you here, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Phil. It's a real honor. But yeah, the thing about qualifications is that's something we could go into the corruption of university education. And I think experience and failures and just working with people is where you learn really and reading books, of course, and uh, attending events like yours and mingling with uh, like minded people. But thank you for the intro anyway. Oh, absolutely. No, I, well, that's what I love about it, that you've seen through that, that, that brainwashing and picked out the good bits and thrown a load of the rest away. It's fantastic. Listen, one thing I'd love to ask you right at the beginning of this is my kids. Can you talk to my kids? Right? Talk to my kids just for a moment here. I'm going to replay it to them at some point. Tell them what getting stuck in a screen actually does. And how much it's probably worse than them having the odd chocolate binge, right? Tell them what's going on with kids and, and have a rant at, at, at kids and screens these days. Kids and screens. Well, I think the main thing is that it, social media isn't real. And luckily, when we were at school, uh, we didn't have all of this falseness. And it's just going to really affect your self-esteem, your confidence. And lots of kids or younger people struggle with that. The other thing, very simply, is dopamine um, is such an important neurotransmitter and the screen basically just sucks it out of you. So it's opening you up to anxiety, depression, and all teenagers or young people must know, people at school who are on antidepressants already. And I think being a teenager is hard enough already, but when you get sucked into the crazy world of social media without... Uh, understanding life it's a really good way to get a distorted view and and the other thing about the screens is uh, our uh, myelin around our nerves is fully developed whereas it's still developing uh, in young people and there are certain times in your life where you if you really mess stuff up say movement you can learn it again as an adult but if you bugger up your nerves and your myelin uh, really early there's no going back 
And uh, even somebody who doesn't know very much about biochemistry knows about MS and that the myelin wraps around the, the neuron. So it's your insulation. And we only have one brain and we need to really look after it. Yeah, there's some drummers out there, I think, have got about four brains, but most of us have got one. <laughs> yes. I suppose there are people, you know, like um, T.S. Wiley and Jack Cruz and stuff who've got several brains. They took the lion's share of the brain cells. But I think also for, for young people, we grew up when there wasn't as much tech. So we had an advantage, like we're more resilient and there's so much more shit to deal with um, it, it, these days. And for, for young people, especially in the UK, the NHS is not going to help you. It's not got the resources when your mental health crashes. And mental health, I think, is probably the biggest risk for phone use. It's going to totally bugger up your sleep as well. And that's going to make your mental health worse. And it's sort of torment when you have mental health issues. And everything's so overburdened now in this country. Good luck getting some help. But you can easily undo it. You don't have to get off the, the screen. You just need to moderate it basically just treat it like uh, what it is which is like an addictive drug and blue light and the addictive aspect of blue light google and apple have known about this forever that that's why all screens have blue light coming out because they want you to be stuck on them they want to control you and i think a lot of young people want to sort of be independent and think yeah i know everything but deep down you're just being completely and utterly brainwashed and controlled and again, it's a long way back out of sort of that kind of part of your life. Yeah. And 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 you said on another one, I heard you saying that, that you know, it, as in everything, the, the poison is in the dose. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where you don't notice that it's doing you any harm immediately mm -hmm. do you. And it's a sort of cumulative thing and it creeps up. And Absolutely. And also it really damages your retinol, your vitamin A. So if you want really bad eyes really early, then carry on using your screen with no red filter. And, you know, once like eyes are like brains, when we talk about quantum biology or neurology, the eye is king. And if you destroy those, I mean, yeah, we've got two of them, but destroy them early and there's no going back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, on, on the red light thing and um, and 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 what you should do in your house, because I I'd also talk to me as a kid, really, because I'd, I'd love to get the real sort of um, uh, practical aspects of this, because, you know, you've gone into a lot of the science in some of the other podcasts and uh, really fantastic stuff. But you also make it actually pretty um, understandable. But what. Um, what would you say? Because we 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 both we're both friends of Jack, of Jack Cruz, and he's he's amazing. But a, a lot of the time, people listen to him, and it's a bit above them. But he's been saying recently that you know in the evenings it should be completely and utterly pitch black, and obviously getting you know the the serotonin up in the mornings by getting the lights first thing. But you know, what would you actually have to do in, in, in the house in the evenings to, to get this sorted? Because we, having listened to Jack recently, I wonder if it's if we're actually going far enough. Like we have some small incandescent bulbs. We have all the screens on red if anybody uses them, you know, with iris on the full sleep thing. And they're turned off, you know, sometime before bed. There's a, a screen over the front of the TV if anybody watches that in the evening. We've got the only light we have in the living room is we've got a corn snake and a boa constrictor <laughs> and we put you know they've got some little leds and we put them on red so that it's hardly anything and it's sort of facing the back of their cage and so there's this dim red glow is that enough or do people need to be really fumbling about in pitch black in the evening do you think now i think it depends on your gender because women are more sens sensitive to light anyway and um, it, it's because our skin's thinner, our, the way we process light is different and our collagen's different. So for women, um, you do need to mind the evening and the darkness a lot more because I'm pretty resilient to most things, but the blue light in the evening is a real problem. But what I've actually found in the UK and when I stayed in the US is it's not necessarily my light in the house because I can control it. Like you say, I mean, I don't have a telly or anything, but I use candles and a UV bulb. It's other people's light coming in from outside so I would say one really important thing is to have decent um, sort of curtains because some people make the mistake of doing exactly what you do 
uh, and then they let everybody else's junk light in through the window and I did this for ages and didn't realize and then now I make sure I have that blocked um it, it depends I always say to people it depends on whether there's a problem if the household is all sleeping very well you've probably done a lot right with the light um and like you say the, the it's it's light from above that's the problem the way our eye is structured so if, if you can have the above lights off things like low down lamps whether they're some people use amber some use candles some use red like you said i use uv it's less disturbing uh, to the person so so maybe if you want to elaborate on any health issues in your house yes well um yeah the, the, as far as the things above it's awful isn't it i mean I go into other people's houses and they have those those sort of LED downlighters and they're just the worst things. That you can feel it as soon as you go in. But yeah, health issues in our house. Well, my my kids are are, are very healthy actually. They're really no problems whatsoever, and um, very very chill, very cool, very carnivore too, and not strictly, but very very uh, very good. I think um, <clears throat> probably the worst. Uh, um, issue we've got in the house is um like jack says you know my missus is from tanzania and he's he's always saying have you still got that black missus of yours in in the north of england she's like a cactus in the tundra he says and it's like and, and, it, and it did come to a head you know in 2019 when she got diagnosed with graves disease and you know that took a bit of fiddling to get under control and whatever but um yeah i think I think probably the person who is affected the most is uh, is is Detta, my missus, who who has uh, you know very 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 dark skin, and a thyroid issue. No, also compounded by twenty years of vegetarianism and um, growing up in Arusha, where they put a hell of a lot of fluoride in the water to the extent that people get fluorosis on the teeth. You know, she's got evidence of it. Although the teeth are great and no fillings or anything, but you can see that there's some fluoride trapped in there, which obviously will mess up the thyroid as well. But, you know, the the the, the lack of sunlight here, not enough for her skin, I believe, and, um, and, and crap light at night. She's probably a bit worse than the rest of us at it. And she works in the NHS with artificial light. You know. Oh, yes, an EMF. See, I was going to say with her, it's definitely she needs more light in the day than we do, because, again, melanin is amazing, but it does block um, the the it does block the valuable sunlight. And actually, that's really interesting about Graves disease, because I think we were talking about deuterium and um, antibodies and wh how what kind of Graves disease was it? Because I know there's an autoimmune variety, but also how, how did she overcome it? Well, she she overcame it with um, a, a very, very strict PKD carnivore type diet and an iodine protocol to the, oh, yes. to the extent that because they say that that's going to kill you. The endocrinologists, they freak you out. They say you take any iodine, it's going to kill you. We got our mega doses and the, um, the thyroid levels came down uh, very quickly. But she has since slipped back into eating different things and um and now also i believe takes some low dose naltrexone as well which she was and probably if she got a load more strict with the with the particularly the the quantum stuff i think and um and and a strict pkd thing for a while she'd probably put it completely into remission but i'd say it's sort of like under control now but yes there was an autoimmune component of it definitely that's really interesting because i think with fluoride people don't realize it's the most electronegative uh, element in the periodic table so it's going to steal electrons from everything and our energy is in our sort of water semiconductor system so it's going to basically in simple language completely flatten your battery so it's not just a thyroid issue the fluoride extends beyond that it's just a complete energy stealer and then we need energy to over to run the body basically and then if you mentioned she was vegetarian for for a long time deuterium is another terrible energy robber and sometimes you can just break things down into simple language that you just don't have enough power in your body to run basic processes of defending yourself running your organs running your your hormones but i think regarding your wife if she got better 
um, she can be she believes as a way out and then people slip back and then the antibodies and the symptoms start to come back again. Also, there's a big correlation between low vitamin D and high deuterium and a, a variety of unpleasant illnesses as well as um, autoantibodies. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, I think this whole business of, of, of melanin that I've been trying to understand <laughs> through Jack and through you, it is fascinating. I mean, my own journey with it. Um, when I look at pictures of myself as a kid, you know, we used to travel all the time as everybody did in those days. You could afford it on one person's income and there was no restrictions and all that. And off we used to go. Spain, Jordan all the time. We had lots of friends in Jordan. And I never wore any sunscreen. Um, I, and, and I used to go out all day in the sun. And I was an amazing, really, really dark color. And always. Uh, and then when I, uh, probably 30 years, I spent wearing contact lenses, more and more sensitive to the sun, more and more overweight up until 2010. And um, then I've always wearing sunglasses as well. I had this Oakley collection that I loved, you know, as a mountain biker and whatever. And I thought, yeah, these Oakleys are cool. So I was wearing contact lenses, sunglasses, avoiding the sun all the time because whenever I went out in it, I hated it and I could not go brown. And this has got a little bit better since I lost a bunch of weight, lost a bunch of inflammation, stopped eating the seed oils, that kind of thing. But it never quite came back. And it's, it's, it's you know, I go out in the sun, everybody else goes brown and I'll go a little bit brown on my body and bright red in my head. And it kind of stays like that way. And I think I've messed up melanin with all of those sort of bad life hacks that I did over over the years. Do you think that, that that people can become really just mess all of these processes up with with sort of, you know, contact lenses, shades, avoiding the sun, sunscreen, all of these things that we go through and seed oils and what happens with the melanin there? Is it possible to get it back again? Do you think there's anything I could do to ever sort of go brown again and have my proper melanin functioning back? Oh, yeah, definitely. So first of all, with melanin, even people with a Fitzpatrick skin type of one, you know, the very pale and freckled and according to whoever makes these charts that they can't get they can't tan but they do so the very first step in that is would be doing something called hybrid tanning so that's when you expose yourself to the red light from the sun naturally so there's plenty of that out in the morning and then that sort of builds a solar callus you can use photobiomodulation as well that's red light panels but then i always think the sun's better and then you can gradually uh, expose yourself to the sun so you need the uva um to, to make the melanin and absolutely at any age anybody can re, re um melanate but also very importantly there's neuromelanin and other types of melanin there's u melanin as well we won't go into that but the neuromelanin is the melanin inside so that's where doing something like cold thermogenesis especially in the uk uh, allows you to build your neuromelanin from the inside and again we've got the melanin on the outside which the body can draw inwards so the melanin inside us that we can't see is actually the more important because it's the one that is neuroprotective it's everywhere coating sort of pretty much uh it's, it's everywhere in the body it coats our senses and we can't see that melanin and again, somebody with genetically dark skin might have melanin on the outside, but they may have lost their melanin on the inside. So there's plenty of ways that people can rebuild uh, their melanin. I don't ever think anybody's too old or too broken or too anything to, to recover. Because, I mean, look at Jack, for example. He didn't just get into all of this until his 40s. And he, out of everybody on the planet, probably lived the worst life ever. And he now has a tan all the time. So it doesn't really, it's no barrier. If you've, if you've messed things up in the past, it doesn't mean you can't fix yourself. And 100% you can um, remelanate yourself. Cool, because, you know, it's a hell of a lot better than it was. I mean, I used to sort of, any, any, any sun whatsoever, I'd actually walk from the house to the car kind of like this. And and it was it, it was crazy. But now I love the sun. But when I've had enough, I know I've had enough. But I think I definitely need more morning exposure. And that's what a lot of people miss, don't they? Yeah, With definitely. Because first of all, I think the sunrise is non-negotiable because 
we we need to set the, the the body clock for the day and there's irrefutable evidence now that the more out of sync your body clock is the the shorter your lifespan and health span and you it's like trying to join a party halfway through if you've missed the sunrise you've missed important components of the setting but then people don't really understand about the the uva rise so that's probably about an hour and a half after uh, sunrise and that's where the melanin is going to get made it also makes all of your neurotransmitters your serotonin dopamine endocannabinoids alpha msh and in very simple terms for people who've never heard any of this before if they can just do three things which is seeing the sunrise get out in the uva even for half an hour and do their best to block blue light at night that that's a massive feat and is going to really move the needle and to do all of those consistently and do it properly even if it's cloudy i know that some people say no uv can get through the clouds but uh some can and uh, again there are benefits maybe we'll go into it later of what cloudy days can offer that lots of people don't know about but i think you're correct that the morning sun is the most important because as I mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast we have an epidemic of mental health problems and if you just look at what gets made when UVA is out it's basically our biological pharmacy and a whole load of sort of psychiatric medication that we can all make completely naturally ourselves with UV light. Also, I just want to touch on, you mentioned about um, indoor lighting because you can get UVA lights to have inside the house because yes, there are problems with the amount of UVA in certain countries at certain times of the year. So there are ways to get it. And even if you can't get out physically, you can always open a window, crack the, as in open the car window, not crack it to let the UV in because you also alluded to the fact you wore contact lenses. So that's going to block the the important light signals uh, from the sun and it only needs sort of f a very few photons to get a signal in the eye. So even if people do wear contact lenses, what I've said to them is maybe um, take one out for a bit that your your better eye, so force your lazier eye to see without the, the contact uh, lens, uh, sorry, the other way around. So, so force your lazy eye to work or just um, do your best to have glasses for the first half of the day and then maybe put the contacts in uh, later because I do appreciate I don't ha wear glasses or contacts so it's easy for me to say and then I think you mentioned the sunscreen that for people who are new to all this that blocks all the light signals that the skin gives and ideally we want a, a, we don't want sensory mismatch or a signal mismatch we want the skin and the eyes to give the brain the, the same information about the the light from the sun and again like I said the more accurate our body clock are the, the the better our lifespan and health span and like you said for making things practical sometimes just opening a window can be helpful and as i said earlier as well how important being cold is because we're not designed to be warm adapted you can get two bonuses at once of um fresh air cold and light uh, at the same time yeah, I, I, I ended up getting my eyes lasered in 2006. And I, I, I kind of wish I hadn't. I wish I'd sort of discovered maybe Jake Steiner's website of how to sort of uh, uh, sort that out because it changes the shape of the eye and sort of uh, risks a bit of retinal detachment later on. I've got away with it so far. My vision is great. But Jack kind of freaked me out at one point and some of the stories about, uh, you know, having him lasered. And, and Jack was saying, you take, is it... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, the, something off the front of the eye, is it melanopsin or some receptors or something? That yeah, you get it can do. The the eye and, and it, but if I get away with it without committing suicide and getting, apparently he said people, you know, after LASIK surgery, they end up committing suicide quite quickly. You know, some well, people. I think it's more the, the cataract surgery. That's the real problem. Ah. That because at least with the, con well, I suppose with the LASIK, the thing is I don't like to scare people because you have to remember Jack can scare that terrify people and they think they're going to die tomorrow and there's no solution other than move to the equator but but i think yeah there's it, it, it any kind of invasive activity to the eye is going to compromise it um but for some people they've already done it so it, like yourself you've done it now um but there's still plenty of functional parts of the eye that can re um, receive light because the sclera can absorb or receive light as well so it's one of these things that 
if people can avoid surgery, then do that. Um, but if they've already had it, not to think it's all the end of the world. And that that thing about the LASIK surgery, yes, I've heard the same, but then people do tend to exaggerate sometimes and then it really alarms the people who didn't know. But I think that's all about information, isn't it? That people should always be seeking um, the truth and people might think, oh, I know about the food nonsense and the pharmaceutical companies and that's it. But there's like um, hundreds more um, sort of lies and fibs and uh, and things. So uh, just for your audience, ne never stop digging for more truths because there's um, money grabbers left, right and center in all sorts of industries um, that we wouldn't expect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, half a sec. Um, it finished? Yeah. Um, yeah, Jack always says to me, sorry, I'm, I'm just getting my missus to turn the washing machine off. It's finished. I don't want it bleeping. It bleeps with a warning. I don't want that on. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm distilling some water at the moment, but I don't think you can hear because... Um, <laughs> Uh, Zoom and my microphone are quite good at blocking out um, outside sounds, but beeping, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that can come through. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but what the hell. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny, actually. Jack always says to me, will you be a light guru and not a food guru? I say to him, well, there's a couple of reasons for, for why I still go on about it. And that is that, you know, I, I think it's quite easy sometimes to say to people, uh, sort out your light, you know, get it, get it nice and dark in the evenings, get out in the morning, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and sort out the emotional stuff, get the spiritual stuff together, look at this, go and get some grounding, and that's all very interesting, oh, that's cool, yeah, let's do that, and then eat a bunch of steak, oh, fuck off, they go, <laughs> you can't do that, that's the most unhealthy food there is, so there's so many misconceptions around it, and so much war against meat at the moment, and also the other side of it, I think, is that although I, I'm not militant at all, I think people should do exactly what they want. It's not my business what they eat. And and, and there's things I'd like to ask you about the sort of quantum information in food later on. It's really been fascinating me. But I do see when somebody is pushed to the point where they have sort of crippling rheumatoid arthritis, apart from a dry fast or something, there really is nothing quicker than sort of really fatty beef and lamb and nothing else. It just seems to heal the gut very quickly. Whether that's at the root cause of it, but even that works so much better if they get all the quantum stuff right. But it does seem to be, you know, somebody's in real trouble with sort of rheumatoid arthritis and, and, and they change their light bulbs, if you see what I mean. It doesn't do anything as quickly as figuring out the diet, but it's probably more powerful in the long run, if you see what I mean. I so think it's um, person dependent because I just want to backtrack about the the, the fatty lamb. So first of all, that's really low in deuterium, which yeah. is a heavy isotope of hydrogen, which we probably go into. And also lamb, even though seafood's got a lot more DHA, lamb has got the highest amount of DHA. And we need the natural DHA in the SN2 form, the one that can get into our brains and basically uh, behave like a semiconductor in the body. And I think you alluded to the lamb as a good choice and i'm very much the same and also it's the simplicity of just say to people look just for 30 days just eat eat um eat meat that's it no, no, you know and, and no matter how much people try and say oh uh, it might be dangerous it's like look for 30 years you've been eating you know all kinds of disgusting rubbish out of factories and you never qualmed or questioned then you're not going to uh, nothing horrible is going to happen in 30 days uh, just just humor me give it a try but I think it also with the light I think it just depends on the person because you have to ask them uh, about their life and some people aren't too bad with their ways of eating uh, whereas their light is just so horrendous and their body clock so horrific that's going to move the needle more but also if somebody's not sleeping again that's where the quantum aspect can really move the needle because they can finally get to sleep make melatonin do the autophagy apoptosis and, and start to heal when they should so so i'm completely with you i'm very intolerant these days about people eating crap and then complaining to me about all these problems it's just very much just stop it you know uh, it's not difficult um and even if people do really well for a week and then have a binge so what they they're trying 
Um, and I think I think it's very personal what is a big needle mover. And you do need to know somewhat of people's history. Um, but I don't see think there's anything wrong with doing both at the same time, because it's natural to want to be outside and be connected with nature to ground. Um, but it's also natural to eat food that is actually food. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I always say to people, however good the diet is, you're not going to heal if you're not sleeping. Mm. The sleep's not there and, and and you're not not uh, not not using that time to to repair and replace various dodgy body parts. You know, it's uh, it's not going to work. But <clears throat> something I heard Jack say ages ago that I'd love to get you to explain to people, because I'm sure, you know, and I don't really know the process of it. But what is this business about when you eat carbohydrates, it actually sort of releases a whole load of blue light inside the stomach. Uh, via the bacteria and whatever i've got this all jumbled but i'd love you to put that together what's going on there do you know what i'm talking about um the thing is when it comes to the gut microbiome i tend to not comment that much because we hardly know anything about it and yes mm. uh, bacteria um, produce about five thousand times more light than our cells which is how our immune system can chase things around the body but, but the way i look at the carbohydrates in terms of light is when you eat carbs, you're going to run electrons through complex one in the mitochondria, whereas when you eat fat, it skips over that. And it's much less inflammatory to run electrons um, and skip over complex one. But there's value in running electrons through complex one sometimes because the superoxide surge um, is going to kill off all the bad mitochondria. Uh, and, and type two diabetics have a problem with complex one in their mitochondria because they've just been banging electrons down it for the last sort of 30 years with all the carbs and basically in simple terms broken it but then this is back to sometimes it can be beneficial for people to eat actual proper food that they've grown themselves that grows locally that does contain carbs in it which will be in the summer when there's plenty of ultraviolet light around because it can be beneficial to run the electrons through complex one and trigger apoptosis of weak mitochondria but that's my way of thinking of it but then knowing people like i know them people do deviate from carnivore and keto anyway and think they've cheated and are a bad person or whatever but but it's one of those things that you know, it happens. I can't really comment on the gut microbiome and whether more, I possibly more light gets made. I just don't want to talk about something that I'm, I'm not qualified to. I, what I do think is really important with the gut is making sure it can make hydrogen gas or hydrogen. That's vital because we know that hydrogen, like an electron, is the master sort of antioxidant and hydrogen can get everywhere into the, in the body. It's so small and just in simplistic terms, hydrogen emits red light. So it's like having little tiny suns all going around your body. So I would say I'm more of a, a keen on looking at hydrogen gas production in the gut because there's a sort of thousands of studies on that whereas the biophotonics is in some ways just speculative i'm sure when we have the right technology and we can actually look at bioluminescence in the body properly so much more is going to come to light about the gut microbiome uh, and the light show in the gut but but at the moment i think people should sort of focus on um if they want to do something quantum with the gut to fix their circadian rhythm, maybe use some red light on the gut and then really look into hydrogen production uh, in the gut. Uh, and the, the kind of bacteria, the the anaerobe, sorry, the um, the aerobic bacteria, the ones that like uh, that make that like sugar and stuff like that. If you've got too many of those, that's going to tank your hydrogen uh, production in the in the gut. But say if you eat an apple once a week, it's going to do nothing. So so that's the take I can um, bring you from a quantum perspective about the gut and something that I know there's a lot of research about that's very doable for people. And just taking hydrogen tablets isn't the answer because just so people know with those, I used to like them, but then one company makes all of the hydrogen tablets that there are and they just come in different labels. And unfortunately, they're contaminated with lead. So, so they might be really helpful as in an acute phase if somebody was really struggling or needed to travel and wanted to take hydrogen tablets. But I wouldn't take them long term like, you know, you're a big advocate of. You've got to have long sightedness for the future and change your habits not just use supplements although i'm not against supplements i think you need to know in detail all these nuances about what you're taking and it might be beneficial for three days but for three years is detrimental 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> the supplement thing is 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 funny, isn't it? Because there, so much of it is sort of packaged with all sorts of crap, and it's not bioavailable. Keeps the gut leaky with all these sort of corn fillers and whatever. And something that you've um, brought home to me that uh, a load of them contain deuterium, right? Do they not actually put it in on purpose sometimes or something? Um, no, I think with with deuterium, what it is. With um, biology and chemistry and stuff that most people have seen pictures of molecules and, and there's carbons. And then if you type in molecular structure plus hydrogens, you'll see that pretty much everything, everything has got hydrogens in it. And f just naturally for every hydrogen, there's about every million hydrogens, there's about 150 deuterium. So, so say if you have a factory and you're producing supplements because it's expensive to fractionate the deuterium and the hydrogen and companies supplement companies want to make as much money as possible they're going to skip over that step so you are going to end up with deuterium in supplements so any i'm not just talking about hydrogen tablets i'm talking about any molecule like creatine anything uh, amino acids that that you have to synthesize it is going to have deuterium in it and then the other aspect about supplements are some of the ones we take go actually right into the mitochondria. So you're trying, you're taking deuterium into the worst possible place in the body. And I think it's it's like everything. It, as you said earlier, the dose dictates the poison. That, that taking some supplement short term for a reason is going to be within reason acceptable as long as you know, they're necessary. But but if you if people are ending up on sort of a thousand pounds or dollars or whatever worth of supplements shoveling in handfuls a day, the amount of deuterium in that is going to be unhelpful um for what they're what they're trying to achieve and obviously certain supplements are worse than others like collagen powders heavy in deuterium just because that's where it concentrates naturally um in in collagen and then we further processed and, and concentrated it so there's all sorts i could say about supplements i don't want to say oh they're all crap you must never take anything i think you need to be really selective about what you're trying to achieve and ask can i achieve this naturally um, or um, is this supplement going to give me enough to get a bit better so then I can move forwards and, and start moving more or going out more? So it, I think it's a really interesting topic. But no, they don't put it in on purpose. They just can't be bothered to remove it. Oh, I see. I got you. That's, that's good. Because actually just before we came on this podcast, I was doing a consult with somebody and um, they were asking about collagen powders and I was saying, don't take them, but it was for, it, it was for a different reason. But now I've got another reason to tell people why not to, you know, I think, I think just so. if you want to get some collagen, get some bone broth in or whatever, you know. Oh, definitely. Cause ox tail yeah. is um, great for collagen because the tail, the legs of an animal take loads of tensile load. So we're supposed to have deuterium in our collagen in places where we put lots of stress through to strengthen it. Whereas ox tails, all the tail does is just flap about a bit. So even though it's, very collagenous it doesn't have a lot of deuterium and there's all sorts of other parts like i'm um, cheek has got lots of collagen rib there's all sorts of the sort of cheaper which i find superior cuts of meat actually have um benef be beneficial collagen i think marine collagen is slightly different because the amount of um load that goes through the fish when it swims because it floats most of the time is going to be different but again we're not a fish we're, we're a mammal and i just think it's better to sort of um be careful with with anything that's a supplement because there's plenty of ways you can get marine collagen yourself i mean it's going to be in fish bones and all sorts because i know some people aren't fans of seafood and others are um and i think back to your person with the collagen there's so many other ways to boost your collagen like red light uh, cold cold face plunges um making sure you've got adequate copper because it's one of these myths that we're all copper toxic, toxic and anemic it's one of these places where people have got things a bit mixed up and um copper's vital for for collagen and bone um in the right amount so don't rush out and buy a copper supplement that's not the solution and then like i was saying you can use quantum approaches to boost your collagen um and again remove things which are going to be detrimental to your collagen because was your client looking for joint health or um aesthetics of like facial stuff with the with their collagen supplement no it was a long-term rheumatoid arthritis kind of case yeah but the thing is i think in terms of rheumatoid arthritis um 
trying to treat something that where there's a problem with the immune system by putting in collagen, which probably is not going to end up in the joints anyway. I just don't see it. You're putting more deuterium in to a person that's already got lots of deuterium. So it's kind of um, there. Are, there are better supplements for for joints. But again, um, I wouldn't go for collagen. And the, and the research is so hit and miss now like one week there'll be oh collagen's beneficial the next week oh no it doesn't do anything and when you look to see who funded these collagen studies there's plenty of supplement companies funding them so it's distorting the the research and and when you get studies where it's so hit and miss like that you've got to sort of question it and it's such a money spinner and it's a very easy sell to people oh collagen's going to make your skin look nice oh collagen's really important for your bones and the poor public just buy these sort of sales pitches. And there are some amazing videos and sales pitches. I nearly buy stuff so often because it's just so compelling and they're so clever with the psychology and, you know, the FOMO and how you must have this. I think people really need to be, be careful because I've worked within reason with advertising, making my own work and have been mentored and the amount of manipulation of science that goes on in adverts and, and it's got away with. And that can be, that's a very large part of what people see on social media is advertisements and they're extremely clever and extremely compelling. And the collagen ones, even if we watched one now, we would probably be, oh, should we buy? Should we buy? And it's like, <laughs> no, we know, we know it's, a, we know it's a trick. Yeah, yeah, they're clever, aren't they? <clears throat> it's funny, you know, when 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 I do um, speak to people and and really try to get the the whole light thing in as well, it was it was a wonderful example a little while ago where somebody had come to me who was three years carnivore and had fantastic results, and then suddenly started putting on weight. She was saying, "Why why am I suddenly putting on weight?" And I said, "Well, you know, we're going through her." what she was doing during the day and whatever. And she was a massage therapist and had um, started to get really worried about shedding from customers, from the jabs and whatever, you know, whether this is a real thing or not, who knows. But um, it certainly seems to affect some people. And and she thought, I, I, I need to stay at home. And uh, so she got into trading. She was doing like Forex trading or whatever and um, spending all day in front of the computer. And I said, was that exactly when you started to put the weight on? Oh yes, do you have any sort of screen, you know, filters or whatever? Oh no, no, I'm all day on the, on the computer. And I said, that was exactly when you started to put the weight on, right? And she said, yeah, absolutely. God, I never thought of that, she said. It's amazing, isn't it? How that will, will, will start to mess around insulin and whatever. Oh, definitely. Because via POM C, when you just sit in blue light, um, you make more cortisol and more um, something called clip, which acts like insulin. So your blood sugar goes up and you've released sort of two storage hormones um, into the system. And also the absence of natural blue light from the sun. So blue light from screens is a particular wavelength. I think it's 435 to 460. And that's the harmful one. Whereas the full spectrum of blue from say 400 up to 500 we'll say which is green outside that actually shrinks fat cells uh, and we've got blue light receptors all over the body so there is a big distinction between a single or very narrow bandwidth of blue light that we'll just say is fattening and then the blue light you get from the sun is slimming and that's sort of all you know why i'm in favor of when it's possible to go outside naked to get the real the, the proper blue light and also if she's if she's just inside all day trading she's not getting any uva light and then that makes alpha msh which not only makes melanin it regulates appetite as in decreases it and there's a million other things i could go into because she's probably not seeing the sunrise uh, and and such like so she's very likely to be leptin resistant as well because leptin is a circadian hormone but it's also there's a deuterium element to it as well so if you're bathing in blue light you're also discouraging the deuterium from leaving your body so she's basically done about four or five things to promote uh, weight gain and I've definitely seen people who do keto or carnivore do exactly that and then suddenly start to run highish blood sugar. And then when I look at the light environment, you can see exactly what's driving that in the background. 
because you have to jump on this early because people will all of a sudden go, oh, I did keto and carnivore and it worked for a bit. And now I'm even fatter than I was before. It's like, hang on a minute. It isn't just about the food. Let's look at other things before we start trashing stuff when we haven't looked at things through other lenses as well. And also if she was trading, not massaging, she's just sitting and any kind of movement, um, anything is even, I'm not into all of the whole, the bros and the calories in, calories out, but I am very much into fidgeting, just little small movements it is going to use up energy. So if she's just glued to her screen uh, trading, she's taken away the movement aspect as well. And uh, also when you don't move, your collagen doesn't, you're not going to produce electrons because collagen's piezoelectric. So when you move about, you can start to produce some of your own electrons. And leptin in very simple terms sort of measures how much energy is on board. So if you're losing electrons left, right and center because you're never grounding, um, you're never moving, leptin is going to sense an energy crisis in your body, even though you've got plenty of body fat. So again, everything she's doing is kind of compounding this uh, th th this weight gain um, problem uh, that she had. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> One thing I, I was I, I was very interested in in something that you put in a little email to me uh, um, last week or something, and it was about how you grow stuff to get the sort of information from it. And and you know you, you hear a lot that if you grow your own plants, there's some real beneficial stuff in there. If it's, you know, in your, on your own land, in your own space. And, you know, for me, I feel way better without any plants. And, you know, there's this huge thing in the carnivore world at the moment about, you know, Anthony Chafee's great. His, his plants are trying to kill you video. It's fantastic. I love Anthony. He's, he's, he's great. But I had Natasha Campbell McBride on the podcast recently, and she made a very good point as well that, you know, not that they're particularly necessary to eat, but we got away with it a lot better before everything that probably is ever sold in a supermarket at some stage has been spread uh, sprayed with these, um, you know, basically wide spectrum antibiotics, which are these pesticides that they spray or the glyphosate and whatever. So we've been killing off microbiome and whatever, whatever we've been doing, wrecking our guts. And so we're not... Um, we're not so tolerant of plants as we used to be. Like as a kid, I was perfectly fine eating plants and meat and whatever. I mean, things started to go wrong when I went um, when I went sort of macrobiotic and, and and that kind of thing. But I think that was more mental health. But that could have been down to the enormous amounts of psilocybin and LSD I took at the around <laughs> those those couple of years, nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty. There were some crazy years, but. Yeah. You know, you're, you're talking about that. Where do you stand on 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 this whole business of plant toxins? I mean, I've been there with the spinach smoothies and had the had the um, had the kidney stones and whatever and the oxalate thing. My God, the pain of that. So I learned my lesson there. But when you're looking at this whole sort of plant versus meat thing, and you mustn't eat any plants, what's your view on plants and and the, the say the the downside of the of the toxins in them but the upside of 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 what you're talking about that sort of quantum information that you might get from locally grown plants be fascinated to hear your take on that I, I think you've touched on really important things so first of all lots of fruit and vegetables are engineered like a pink lady and broccoli they're not even somebody's invented those so straight away that's they're not real fruit and vegetables. Whereas if you want to grow your own, like my family do, we've, we have, I have apple trees and they're all just sort of a genuine British kinds of apples that have been around for hundreds of years that nobody's fiddled about with. Um, so in terms of what you were saying about pesticides and, and the way plants are treated, I completely agree, especially the leafy ones are just an open target for glyphosate and a hell of a lot more. My cousin um, has an organic farm and, you know, you, your eyes would boggle at what goes through the organic loophole. So even if you buy, sometimes it's you're unsure what's actually been on it. And also when it comes to growing naturally in light, sometimes people grow plants in under plastic or under artificial light anyway so the plant has lost the quantum information from the sun to start with so, so when what you were asking about is let's pretend like you can there's plenty of things you can pick you can even pick rose hips in the uk at the moment or mushrooms so, so they basically have absorbed information from the sun in exactly the same location to where i am 
And I mentioned sort of sensory mismatch earlier in terms of light coming into the eyes and the skin, and we want it to be the same. Our brains also need to always know where am I in space? So not necessarily where all my joints are, that's proprioception and really important, but where am I on the planet in relation to everything else? And because if your plant or your or my apples in the garden, if we both live together uh, and I know exactly what I put in the soil and nothing gets put on my apples or their apple trees, it's they're all natural. Uh, I can get information about my geolocation, but also the information that the apple collects from the sun is exactly the same light that I live in. And also I can pick my apple and eat it straight away. And th there is an amount of electrons left in fresh fruit. It goes after about seven or eight hours. So again, there is value in eating very well prepared, non messed about with produce that's meant to grow in your location. And obviously there are no apples now. So why would I be eating apples? Whereas in the summer, I may have some of my own apples, but I'll pick it and eat it straight away. And the same goes for anything else you can grow in the garden. And you're an expert in all this yourself. And you'll know that the underground vegetables are much more protected than the overground ones. Um, when it and I think you touched on a really good point also that because there's so many other problems um, in our environment of non-native EMFs and blue light and pollution and and stuff we are less resilient and I do agree that plants can be that they contain things which can be irritating and stressful and before we probably could easily deal with that we've talked a bit about microbiomes being um not as good as they used to. So every step of the way with the plant, if people have a bad constitution, I agree that there are certain plants, especially the raw spinach and kale and things with vast amounts of lectins and other plants can be really problematic. Something I find really interesting is that you probably know that a tobacco plants, that's a nightshade and nicotine has a role in sort of biohacking. But what I think is interesting about nicotine is if you've got a, t a bad nervous system, as in a bad parasympathetic nervous system, um, nicotine can be completely transformative because um, nicotine works on the nicotinic acetylcholine pathway. However, if you've got bad mitochondria and you use nicotine because you want to biohack, it's horrific. So, so I think there's something about people having bad mitochondria and then all the other nightshades of which there are lots of plants. It's not necessarily the nightshade that's the problem. It's the person's mitochondria. And as we were talking about earlier, it's much less inflammatory to eat fat and protein and run um, the electrons down the electron transport chain with, say, a keto or a carnivore diet and gradually improve your mitochondria other ways and then maybe return to certain plants if you really, really love them. Because some people it's social that it, it becomes a problem or they just get tired of it. But I would definitely agree with you that constitution wise, we just don't have the same as we used to. But on the other hand, I would say there's massive value in growing your own produce or just picking things that happen to be near you like blackberries and, you know, cause I'm not paying two pounds for a punnet of blackberries where I could probably pick 50 pounds per summer and, and it's just if something's there for free what, what, and it's local and in season and nobody's sprayed anything on it, why not have it? So I think it's an interesting um, sort of discussion. But like you, I'm saying if people have got a problem and every time they eat a blueberry or a or a um, well, like an, an, um, an, an if it's if it triggers something, then just don't eat it. And if you really want to eat all of these things, there's a million quantum things, movement things, other aspects you can do to strengthen your constitution. Do that first and then retry this particular vegetable or fruit that you really, really love. As long as it doesn't come from another country, like if you if you love pineapples and you live in the UK, tough, Get, go and move and live where the pineapples are or view it as a treat. Because the same I think we were talking about in the beginning that people do deviate from their ways of eating and people shouldn't be punished or or chastised for cheating and if somebody loves pineapple fine just have it as a treat but don't think oh i'm being healthy because i'm having pineapple i know it's funny isn't it it was um a vegan arguing with me for a change oh really oh yes well yeah i guess they <laughs> off, off, off facebook at one point and they were saying you, you say it was a couple of years ago so you've been carnival for seven years and yeah no, you're lying. 
it's impossible you can't do it have you really not eaten any plants and i went well actually a couple of years ago i was out night fishing i woke up in the morning and it was a beautiful day and i had my feet on the ground and i was in the sun and there were some blackberries growing behind me and i picked a load and i ate them and why not you know i'm not militant or anything there you are you see you're lying you're not fully kind of oh i had two handfuls of blackberries in seven years or something and why not if i find them growing wild it's absolutely fine and i would do again but it's 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 the ridiculous labels they put on stuff but yeah i i, I think you know people don't realize that uh you know in the middle of the winter as as it said if you're eating a banana under blue light it's not a good idea Oh, yeah, you might as well go and have McDonald's. It's And it's one of these things that people start to say it's sort of ridiculous. But I, to me, it's very logical. And also a lot of people do are concerned about the environment. So not that I ever get into discussions with people who want to be plant based, but it, it's very expensive um, to fly in pineapples and bananas and everything to the UK. So it's not great for the environment at all or the people who get completely ripped off and get paid like one pence an hour to grow bananas for us so it's that yeah. aspect as well and also according to the mitochondria something impossible just happened like it's inside our body our little microprocessor that's sort of um uh, waiting for information from the outside be, be it sort of ma uh, electromagnetism light that to propagate through if you suddenly eat a banana to them it's like well how this is impossible you're in the uk and the bananas come from the equator where the hell am i what's going on and whenever you confuse the mitochondria or the biology you're going to create inflammation because chaos is a sort of biophysical term of inflammation and there's lots of inflammation we can make like the randall cycle is one there's all sorts but just in terms of quantum information if you try and feed your mitochondria a, a, a banana in in january in the uk you've confused everything massively so it's just another way to create inflammation and we do live in an inflammatory environment and we do get more inflamed as we get older so it is something that maybe you could get away with a banana as a child but definitely as you get older and things get more difficult and you've got to up your game but they just have to go i think and i think a lot of the stuff with food you probably find the same there's lots of things i really like and i just stop eating them and after about two weeks i forget they even exist and i don't go in the bit of the shop where they where the stuff is and a lot of you probably come across this a lot people think oh i can't possibly like give up this and they've automatically already you know and even though I love cheese, it's like if I stop it and don't buy any within like a week, I've completely forgotten it even exists. So th th this thing about you must get the set like you're vegan that accused you of being a liar. You just you, you, we just we like habits as humans and we like routines. And you just once you get into a routine, it's sort of much easier than people think. Yeah, definitely. And I, I love there's a, a nice way of explaining it. I think I think it was Jack who said, um, if the food that goes in your mouth doesn't match the light that goes in your eyes, you'll get mitochondrial chaos. Yes. It was a lovely way of putting it. Really. Yeah, very simple. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I heard you talking about some... Um, something that uh, I, can't, I forget exactly what you said, but it's quite similar to something that I often think about because... And I kind of like to transition over into your sort of spiritual side now, but via Ayurveda, maybe a little stop off on Ayurveda and other things like that. A lot of people like I, I, I've, I've been a sort of bit of a yogi for decades, really, you know, up until, well, 2006. I'll go, I'll go into that in a bit. But I sort of moved up to this town that I live in here because it's the center of the sort of transcendental meditation movement. And I wanted to be a TMO and do my sort of sitting in lotus and hopping around on a foam mattress you know, for the rest of my life the and so much of it there is you know you're fooled into plant-based eating through spirituality but we'll get into that but um i think a lot of these things that people do like when they go for traditional chinese medicine ayurveda stuff like that a lot of these things were like ayurveda was supposed to be cognized by the rishis you know and whatever um there weren't so many influences on the planet, were there? And so I see people, you know, trying to to heal by taking a whole load of Ayurvedic pills and still eating a sort of Southern Indian diet in the north of England in the middle of the winter with all their rice and dal and veg and whatever. And it doesn't work. 
it doesn't it, it just doesn't work it might have worked for those subtle imbalances that we had many years ago but these forms of medicine i think they're brilliant i think there's a whole load of knowledge in them but are they just generally not quite strong enough are they to to, to counteract all the crap that we're bombarded with these days Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, um, light and magnetism trumps biology. So the people are sitting in sort of 5G and blue light. And, and basically people who are, say, um, from those parts of the world, their biology is adapted to really strong sun. And now they're eating carbs in, in this kind of weather. But, but back to the Ayurveda and everything, I've got a lot of respect for it. But you have to bear in mind it was developed for people in um, in Asia of a particular in a particular environment and a lot of people don't know we have our, our own um sort of european version or lineage of using plant medicines except it just gets called witchcraft and shamanism and it's tried to it's been suppressed um, by christianity so i've got nothing against the christ uh, and i'm very into christian mysticism i'm just not into all of the information that got destroyed in the name of trying to brainwash people so we've lost a lot of our european um, ayurvedic approaches and the plants and things you can find it again I'm, it's not called ayurveda it's other aspects so, so that's my issue is that yes i'm sure ayurveda works and i think i've seen people have benefits because a lot of it can revolve around different body types and breathing but when it comes to europeans uh, and our physiology we require different plants different approaches and different things which unfortunately is not as well known because you have to bear in mind with ayurveda it's become now a money spinner so that that's that's the problem and again it's like any supplement i don't think you can out supplement bad light and no grounding in a bad diet but i think as i said before it can be a stepping stone for people but they're all plants and stuff in the long run and your liver's got to process them, even things like CBD and medicinal mushrooms, which I, I'm not a fan of CBD, but medicinal mushrooms. Yes, they're still heavy on the liver. So, so you can't take them all the time anyway. It's meant to be a short term help while you make changes and get to the root of what the problem was in the first place and, and it's like sort of spiritual practices i'd rather do what my ancestors which a european did i'm fascinated by sufism the vedas the bhagavad gita i love it i love it all but but i'm not uh, uh, like uh, from an area where my ancestors would have been buddhists i i'm from somewhere where my ancestors would have been something else so i'd rather um follow that chain of sort of spirituality and also when you get very deep into things you find it's all the same anyway i don't but like spoiler alert and spirituality i don't think it's about ceremonies or sitting on mats i think it's about how you behave and act in life and again there are people i know that have got every crystal that can possibly exist and they do ceremonies every day but they're still unpleasant you know they, they don't give to people they they don't forgive anybody that they don't go out of their way to help and I'm not saying I'm perfect. Yeah, of course, I have massive rage explosions now and again, but fundamentally, I'll do my best to try and give and be patient and live uh, um, spirituality rather than just do it. And I think that's kind of a, a very important aspect of healing, including mine, was living rather than just studying and doing it in my house, my ceremonies, whatever I do, and not actually taking it out and giving to the world like you give a lot like all of this we don't get paid for any of this it's like our time and we give out all this sort of really helpful advice and i'm sure you know there's other things we would like to do <laughs> instead of helping people for free but that, that sort of part of spirituality as well of doing stuff that you don't really want to because it's going to benefit others what do you think but I, and again with yoga, I taught Pilates for thirteen years, and I am qualified in yoga. And I think, like any movement, there's huge value in it. There's just a lot more to yoga than just um, sitting in a lotus pose or doing a handstand or um, making the actual asanas. There's a much deeper side to it as well. Totally, yeah, yeah. Just before I get onto that, yes kids watch those ayurvedic medicines i i know several people who've actually had lead poisoning from ayurvedic medicines 
Oh, there's lots of Chinese medicines have got arsenic and mercury and all sorts in them. But but also, like, even though I've got a reasonably good knowledge of botany, I've got no idea what these Chinese herbs are. I, I like when it's when it's other. I've got lots of books on different sort of psychoactive plants and I and I and I know what they are. And I understand I know the alkaloid, whereas these Chinese ones. I can't even read the label and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying I don't know what's in it. Yeah, I know it's confusing, isn't it? No, about the uh, the whole spiritual practice thing. I mean, that's what I was totally focused on for sort of 1980 till 2006 or whatever. And it was funny because I got into I got to the stage where I was just doing really long meditations and loads of asanas and um, doing the whole flying thing and all the yoga, the TM cities, city oh, well, and like all of that. Astral projection and lucid dreaming and all of that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Some of it by accident. It happened quite a lot. Every time I used to lie down after meditating, I used to get all through the eighties. I used to get completely out of my body. I could tell my, my flatmate what he was doing in the other room. Oh, what remote viewing. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, another, yeah, just kind that's of cool. out the body there. Sometimes a bit of a thump as you come back in. But anyway, they, all that stuff, you know, around it. And, and there, are, there are just little diamonds in that dog shit, you know, of, of spirituality, where, as you say, it's all the same in the end. And you get stuck in these sort of cult mentalities sometimes of this is the only way. This is this is what I do. You know, TM is the best meditation in the world. No, it's not. And it's been nicked from other things as well, you know. But it takes a, a while to realize that. And I remember... I was very strict on it and used to meditate twice a day and never missed it and all that kind of thing. And then it kind of fell away a bit. And I started to get almost a religious guilt of like, oh, my God, you know, I'm not doing it. I need to get back into it. And I actually moved back into a house, but not for that reason, but right by the dome here where, the, where everybody goes to meditate. And I thought, oh, I'm only 100 yards from the dome. I must go in every day. And I didn't want to. And it was about 2006 and whatever. 2005, 2000, I can't quite remember. But there was one moment where I thought, I'm letting go of it all. This has been my life for 25 years, and I, I'm letting go of it all. I can't be asked anymore. It's just causing me hassle. And in that moment, in that very moment, I had to sit down on the wall. Just everything that I'd ever wanted out of my spiritual practices came clear. There was that absolute awareness of the unity of everything and how things work at that level. And it was so simple and so ordinary. It's almost like how simple it is to do the quantum stuff, how simple it is to do the eating stuff. Life is actually extremely simple. And it's held up. I mean, I saw it was a real awakening moment to probably what the TM has called cosmic consciousness. And it's never gone away. But it's so it's so ordinary. And I think it's a human's natural state of of of, of awareness. It's like when people say, oh, you know, play if you if you don't eat, if you eat meat, you can't get enlightened. You can't ascend to 5D. That's the latest thing, isn't it? You can't do any of that. But I've I've noticed a deepening of that awareness and it becomes kind of ordinary. And I think saying this about how you can't. You can't ascend if you don't eat this way or you do that. It's, it's very disrespectful to our ancestors, because I believe that the people back there living a proper quantum life and living, eating what they're supposed to eat seasonally, whether it's animals or plants, they were so in touch with nature and probably had this level of awareness naturally. So I don't see it as a big thing. It's like it's almost another thing that's that the elites have taken away from us and and, and, and taking, us, taking us away from our essential nature, whether it's with light, magnetism, with consciousness. So... What do you think about that? That just, you know, I think we always had that kind of level of consciousness. And, and you know, you still rage. You still do this. You still that. You don't become this perfect being just because you've had some kind of awakening like that and seen the seen the ether. Yeah, I think um, you, you've you summed it up. It's all very simple. That's why I mentioned Christian mysticism and Meister Eckhart and nothing and how important nothing is and just having nothing and um, being happy with nothing. And I think also with the food, I just say when people obsess about food and spirituality, sometimes they're just stuck in their base chakra. So it's just people, again, it's 
you know, I'm, every, I'm, everybody's got their own right to a, to a view on spirituality. But back back to Jesus again, he, he did lots of actions. And again, I'm not sort of preaching Christianity, but I absolutely love all the teachings of Jesus. And he always gave everybody time and he did things and he went out of his way to, to be helpful. He didn't just stand and try and lecture people. He did stuff for them. Um, to his own detriment, <laughs> like massively. So I think this idea of saying, oh, no, you can't send to whatever level, because the thing is, how do, how do they know anyway? And yes, I agree that it's easier to meditate. And I mean, fasting is a big aspect of it um, as well. And, and it's something I don't know. I mean, because who, who am I to answer this? But I always find that with my meditative or ceremonial practices, I'm always asking for something for somebody else. And I think fundamentally prayers for others always work better, much better than prayers for your own. So, so there again, I've given my half an hour of time when I've really wanted to ask the universe for something yet I've given time and, and put out help or good wishes or a request for somebody else. So, so I think a lot of the time people can miss the, they get too self-centered about spirituality and think it's all about them, but it's actually more about everybody and everything else and being connected and, and moving at one with the universe like that. Not just me on my own trying to do it, but me at one with, the electrons, the clouds, the animals, other people and move forwards uh, like that. But I think it's a very sort of subjective sort of subject, but, but there's plenty of sort of, it, it does something that really, I, I might digress a bit, all of these fake mediums and spiritual people all over the internet, just it's, 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 it's again a, a way, it's another route into trying to con people of making, you know, there's money again in spirituality, but if you go back to the basics and just focus on the nothing, that's what it's all about, really, nothing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this business about action, you you, you make a great point there, because I see some of these long-term meditators and they're so stuck, They like, if they go out somewhere, they get panicked that they can't get back exactly in time for the dome to go and meditate. Well, you're out somewhere. You're walking around the Lake District. Enjoy it. It's beautiful. Why do you have to go to buy this timetable, you know? And and they'll sort of start every sentence with Maharishi says. And it's almost like their, their will has been taken away. They can't think for themselves. They don't do anything. And they sort of sit down and think that meditating is the only thing. To me, it's like practicing rudiments on the drums and never playing a groove, like playing playing scales on a piano and never playing a, a, a tune. You 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 end up doing that, and you don't do you don't do anything, um, as you yeah, exactly. said. Exactly, and I think like if people are meditating for three hours a day. What are they doing to help anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Why not go and meditate for two and pick up litter for an hour? That's kind of. <laughs> That, that's my issue. It's like, yeah, I love meditating, but part of it's really selfish because I want to chill. Whereas, do you know what I mean? It's like you, people, you get a lot out for yourself from meditation, but then you still need to give back. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, well, it's, you need to you need to bring you need to bring that 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 depth of consciousness into your everyday life. And also, and also sometimes you, you need to take action, don't you? It's like even in the Gita, it's just, you know, Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, sometimes you've got to kick some ass. You've got to go to war. Exactly. And also, I think it's I don't have any if people are really disciplined and love meditating, it's like the spiritual superiority that I'm trying to get to. I've got a problem with, oh, I'm better than you because, you know, you're, you're untidy and sometimes you eat meat and stuff and I'm better than you because I just eat drink vegetable juice and I sit on my expensive mat and meditate for three hours and therefore I'm better than you. That's the, the thing that I'm actually having a gripe at. So. That's fantastic. And I remember thinking like that when I first got involved in the movement, it was like, oh, I'm a meditator and that person's not. So I must be better. Yeah. But at some point I had to give myself a serious slap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's 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 another division, isn't it? It's 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 a way of dividing us. And I think that that is the the thing, you know, the the covid enthusiasts and the and the and the conspiracy theorists, the, the meditators, the non meditators, the vegans, the carnivores. We're all people for Christ's sake. And also, I just think if it works for you and, and through your practices, it gives you energy to help others, then keep doing it. Because what's the point of eating in a way like, say, being very strict, raw vegan and you're so tired all the time, you can't play with your children properly? What's the point of it then? That's why I always think it's like 
a life is experiences anyway. It's like, and even with spirituality, like all the time I'll learn something new and think, oh no, I was wrong. But that's the, my life all over. Everything, no matter what I do, there's always something I've done wrong and therefore I need to find a better way. And it's the same with spirituality. If you ask me in a year what I think, it could be something more sort of different, but completely different to now. But I think it's the same. If you're doing something for the sake of it and then you're not able to participate in life properly then stop doing it yeah absolutely and 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 that's a good point about being wrong i rented a blog post ages ago about the importance of being wrong because people say oh you know oh you were vegan and now you're carnivore well we can't trust anything you say because you keep changing your mind but you learn something new all the time don't you i'm always tweaking things i'm always so happy to be wrong isn't it just the gateway to new information yeah, exactly. And also, it's just it's just part of learning. I think we were chatting about teenagers before and how at 17, you of course, you know everything. Of course you do, because you're 17. And a lot of life is from just being wrong or failing or it didn't work and just being all right with it. Because I always say to people, it's just why don't you just try? And if it doesn't work, at least you've ticked the box. And it's like nobody can know everything. And I'm sure you know, it, it might have, sometimes it's just with my current knowledge at that given time of my life, based on my experience, that was the best answer I could give at the time. But now, 10 years later, with more knowledge and experience, I realise what I did back then wasn't the best. It wasn't wrong, but now I've got something better because I've been through the mill. Uh, and it's like I'll never dismiss anything, but I'll always question everything because there's plenty of echo chambers of bullshit you can get sucked down. And I'm really against gurus and, you know, I'll always check. I'll always do something myself. It's like it might sound absurd, but then what How? What harm will it do to try it? Because, yes, I've been vegan and vegetarian and done Ray Peat and sort of done um uh sort of fitness training and crossfit and all of that so i yes i've done it all and it doesn't mean i'm just changing my mind it's just i was having an experience and that suited the person i was at that time because same as you you've probably been seven different people in one lifetime so <laughs> you know yeah easily yeah so sarah tell me about um about the hypnosis and you used to do stage hypnosis and stuff I oh had, yeah, yes, I did. I had an uncle who used to do that as well. Oh yeah, I um I got into stage hypnosis and I did uh, and I have travelled around doing shows and I've met some sort of famous stage hypnotists and done training with them. But I also used to do close up magic, and that's one thing I do really miss massively. If I had more time, I would love to take up close up magic again because I spent so many thousands of hours fiddling with coins and all my stuff but with the hypnosis I think it started I wanted I was very fascinated by the whole sleep thing and the stage and is this real and are they just pretending and I got really into all the inductions and um, the phenomena we'd call them so there are things like getting people to stick their hand to their head, um, getting people to see things that aren't there, like a positive hallucination or making my whole body invisible. So just my head's floating. Um, and then again, making people think that they're Madonna or whatever. But, but when you work with people that 20 percent of the population are something called a somnambulist, like they're super hypnotizable. And it doesn't matter if they're a surgeon. It's got nothing to do with intelligence or whatever. There's some brain structure that's different. It, it is actually 100% real for them. And I'd love to be a somnambulist because it's basically like you could have like trips or experiences without drugs as long as a hypnotist would come and um, do it for you. So even if people think it's a load of rubbish, I 100% swear to you it isn't. And A, you either need to go and be hypnotized or B, go and learn hypnosis and go and hypnotize some people. And I swear to you, you, you know, even a beginner if taught properly could, could hypnotize. I could, I could teach somebody in a day probably to come out with me and, you know, do say you know hey like even in pubs that's how I learned was doing street hypnosis and obviously lots of I failed a lot and it was really embarrassing sometimes but then when it did work it was like really astounding you'd like build a crowd so yes it's like it's like everything it's got its entertainment side and some people will be really offended and horrified by the idea of making people think they've got talking testicles or laying a square egg and they're a giant <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, uh, yes. Sarah, I tell you what, you that, that's it. You're in trouble now. Yes. I'm not letting you go home early from I know from, I, I don't I don't mind this event. Yeah, I know I want, I want everybody with talking testicles in the evening. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, but but then on a serious note, once you've learned how to hypnotize and convince somebody, if you want to do therapy and you do stuff like that with them in the therapy room, not the talking testicles or eating a sort of um, dirty laundry flavored ice cream or, or smelling the person next to you smells of um, dirty, dirty nappies, that's aside. If you can um, convince people of the sort of induction and the phenomena, if you then want to remove a habit or a bad behavior or help them, the, the, um, the, the compliance of however the subconscious works, even after doing hypnosis for 12 years, I still couldn't explain to you exactly how it works because I don't think anyone knows. They're much more likely to benefit from the therapy um, or the suggestions that you're going to offer because you're able to sh to make their eyes glue together or you're able to make their hand glue to their head and like, oh my God, you know, and then the brain's going to jump on the next most sensible thing you say, which could be, and from today onwards, you'll find cigarettes absolutely repulsive. But it's like there is psychology and language in hypnosis, but there's also nonverbal communication. And over the years, I have learned, I think there's just some etheric aspect. Like there's also the telepathy side, the Rupert Sheldrake morphic field all in there as well. So it's one of these things that definitely works and is real. And it's like the gut microbiome. Nobody fully understands how how. Um, hypnosis works there's plenty of good theories but again there's still I like it's like you know there's still the element of we don't know which is kind of fun yeah I was supposed to do a talk back in I think 2015 2016 with Rupert Sheldrake I was really excited about meeting him and then it got cancelled and nobody oh. <laughs> I never met him in the end anyway it was a shame I know that's a shame because he's a really interesting man, but his son is really interesting as well, uh, Merlin, because he's written a really good book on fungi. And it sounds like why I'd ever want to read that book. But it's like once you start reading Merlin's book, you can't stop. And it is uh, a really. And yeah, Rupert's written some superb. Uh, he's like a like a, a great polymath of a person with four or five brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met him actually once. It was oh, an cool. honor. He, I think he's like he's he's eighty one now. So, but he's sort of um, still going. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. The whole morphic resonance thing makes so much sense. It definitely does. But also, I think I like about Rupert Sheldrake. He's so one hundred percent scientific in other ways. I mean, the book, the um, science delusion, and all of the how he's so he, he's so purely left brained and powerful in one way yet he can be so right-brained and he puts the both of them together to sort of think of sort of new ways of of looking at the world i know people say that he borrowed the idea from somebody else but then we all get inspiration and ideas from other people so does it matter because the way rupert presents things i think is is very compelling and nobody can bash him in any way shape or form for doing bad science because with when he does experiments his uh you know watertight <laughs> yeah absolutely so um there was um something i i just you know this spiritual thing i could i could talk to you about that for hours and hours and I, i'm gonna have to get you back on sometime to really go into that but can we uh the last thing really something i forgot to ask you earlier on what it what would your recommendations be for water everybody argues about which water to drink whether to have reverse osmosis whether to uh you know filter it if that's good enough whether to i mean we're on kind of glass bottled spring water at the moment but i'd really much rather be sort of living next to a glacial stream yeah what, i'd um, say distillation distillation and remineralize it yourself even even for beginners i mean the best distiller you have to buy it from the states and it's about nine hundred dollars and it's like a, a it's not stainless steel the, the actual bowl where you heat the water's glass and it's carbon filter but it's it's expensive but that's the best but then the tabletop distillers it's very satisfying because when you do a batch you can see all the crap left behind and then the problem with the filters are because there's just so many things in in the water like that like twenty thousand or more things the filters just haven't got the complexity to get them all and they lots of them can't get or most of them can't get the fluoride out either 
Um, and I would say a tabletop distiller is very affordable for everybody. And then to remineralize it yourself, because then you can, because I want to obviously control everything um, nowadays. I don't really trust, I don't want a company to put minerals back in. I'll I'll do it. Thank you very much. Because um, I'd rather be in charge. And then you can make some really interesting mineral waters because you can get every single mineral individually. You can buy uh, Celtic sea salt, all sorts of different things, um, stabilized magnesium, uh, all sorts of wonderful things. And it actually tastes absolutely delicious because, because like you with clients and stuff, we do come across people that struggle with weight and being like, uh, cause, um, in, uh, as, as women, we do sometimes struggle a bit more than men. So I have found drinking the mineral water for me personally has been really helpful because it is a big appetite suppressant and the water is just so delicious. It's almost like a treat. Um, and again, uh, back to just basic nutrition. So many people are mineral deficient and that's why they're craving crazy stuff or just eating too much. But, but again, reverse osmosis, I, I can't say I know as much about how that's done. I mean, I do know in theory, it's just per, you'd have to remineralize that as well. But I think it can be more expensive, but it's each to their own. When, when it, as, as long as somebody can guarantee me that what comes out of the other end of the distiller or the reverse osmosis machine has got everything taken out and then I can put what I want back in, I'm happy. But, but say if somebody's all brand new to this, just getting a filter is a good start. Just do that and then buy or get a distiller because they're, they're not very expensive. So that that's my view. And then I know there's the spring aqua system in America. I mean, I think you can get it here for five grand um, that does all sorts. But I think I always believe, yes, you can spend a lot of money on health, but then there are always cheaper alternatives as well. So that's kind of my view. I think also, yeah, it would be nice to have like a glacial low deuterium uh, water spring nearby, but that's just not practical. And again, you can add hydrogen gas to your water. You can add, you can add deuterium depleted water. So, you, and then I always structure my water with sunlight, and I've got a variety of other water structuring techniques. And I think that's partly why I felt so good with the water because when you structure water, in simple terms, it you, you make an exclusion zone, and it has hexagons of water, and each hexagon pops out an electron. So there is plenty of sort of water science to say that you can make coherent water rather than just dead energy free water from from taps so yeah we could go on for ages about water actually but yeah I think absolutely I, I i had a sort of craze of distilled water and it was it was quite a while ago but it was at the end of the sort of vegan phase and i was completely nutrient deficient and i decided the next thing i was going to do would be to drink a gallon of distilled water every oh, that's day. insane because now you just he's got no minerals in it so all it's going to do is suck all of yours out that's oh I tell you what, I, I I must have pulled so much zinc out, I completely lost my sense of taste. Mm. I couldn't taste a thing, and it took a, quite a while to bring it back again. And then I got freaked out by distilled, but I realized that it was just because I had such a, a, a nutrient-deficient diet, and I hadn't remineralized the water. So I sort of railed against distilled water for years, and I, I was wrong. I, I'm, I'm really thinking it's time to get another distiller and and, and just do it properly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the thing, because when I worked in a lab, we used to have five times distilled water. So anything that's laboratory or molecular biology grade, that's the best on the planet because you can't have impurities if you're going to do PCR and work with RNA and stuff. But then we, it was absolutely it, it, he said, if you drink that Q, the five times distilled, you'll rip all the minerals out of yourself and make yourself very ill. So I think it's again about people having a little bit of knowledge, oh, I must distill my water or get reverse osmosis. And then the next piece of knowledge of remineralizing, they miss that. So it's again about, if you're gonna do something, just just make sure you understand the, the, the process and what you're trying to achieve at the end. You don't want water with nothing in it because you need the minerals to structure it anyway. Um, and, and like you said, yes, distilled water on top of being vegan, that's, um, <laughs> on top of emfs that's kind of a delightful osteoporosis risk actually just before we end um as a, as a man what's your views on osteoporosis in men and have you seen more of it because it used to be a sort of woman's phenomenon and being a pilates teacher i've seen loads of it and uh as you can imagine um but then with sort of 
talk, you know, Robert O'Becker's work and, and the astronauts and how there's bone mineral depletion. What, what's your view and have you seen osteoporosis in men? I haven't actually. I mean, I, I haven't seen it in any clients or no, nobody that knows particularly that they've got it. Do you think it's just not <laughs> tested in men because um, yeah. the NHS or whoever know better think it's a female problem? Whereas if we actually did some bone scans on men, we'd get a really horrible result and especially sort of young men who are very low body weight and vegan i i would say, and they're going to tank their hormones as well i would say that there's a big osteoporosis risk for men coming our way definitely and and um you know there's so many of these osteopenia osteoporosis all the, all these diagnoses and it's all the, the sort of bone density issue but you i do see people who get dexa scans you know, and they see the the body composition, they see the bone density coming up and, and, and they do see they talk about that on carnivore groups and whatever, where once they get some decent nutrition in, it does it. And just, you know, I, I, I always sort of assume that people probably have got that if they've got if they've been on some really depleting diet and full of EMFs and whatever. And so just to get everything else right, but also just to jump up and down or do some rebounding or something and put some weight through those the, the bones to tell the bones that they need to be used and not snap. Oh, exactly. No, I agree there about the movement, uh, because sometimes Wolf's Law doesn't apply anymore when, when the EMF and if your copper is really low as well and you're bathing in EMFs, Wolf's Law, you've got to really go to town with it. And I think people forget their own body weight me jumping up and down or running it puts more load through the bones than because obviously you want to do um sort of resistance training but the amount that people need to build up to is a lot more than they think not not to put them off but it's more like whatever you're doing it probably isn't enough um you need to do more but like you said jumping up and down is a is is a really great place to start and uh i think yes I think that's something I might look into a bit more. And I agree, people think of bones as just minerals, whereas if you haven't got enough protein, that's another sort of big, massive sort of issue with, with bone health. Yeah. Do you do much training? I've seen you do a few sort of videos that you've done of oh, uh, yeah, moving I, around in the gym. Yes, I do. Well, the thing is, I got in, I've been into movements for ages. I've played soccer competitively and hockey, and I did Thai boxing competitively and then... Um, yes, I've been to the gym. I learned Olympic lifting. Uh, I did gymnastics. I can play squash. Um, at, at the moment, um, I'm just doing I'm doing actually what you did with the spirituality because I had to go away to America for five weeks. I've thought, OK, I'm going to see what happens when I don't exercise and just do mobility and walking. And does, you know, do, does this um, take a toll on my uh, muscle mass? And I've stopped doing it now, but no, it didn't. Um, and then I'm just at the moment um, not doing, I can't do my cold outdoor swimming because it's even too cold for me. It's like one degrees in the lake. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was one of those things that even though I didn't actually do any training for six weeks, I didn't lose anything, if that makes sense. I could still do when I wanted to go back and do pull-ups or whatever, I could still do everything. And But I think the actual mobility that I do every day is vital. So um, and my new project is about sort of work, sometimes you can't avoid a blue light lit gym. So it's just finding ways to be able to use a gym, even if it's in blue light and what light can I take in with me or what can I do to, to use a gym? Because in some ways I don't want people to not use a gym because of the blue light. It's like you say, it's like the blue light's there. Let's find a way around it. Cause do, do you work out? I mean, it's, it's different things when, when, when it's going to be, when the days are longer, I'll go back to Krav Maga and doing training in the evening. It's just right now. I don't really want to go in and go and do a class at like six o'clock in really bright blue light because I'm a bit sensitive to blue light so I'll just do my working out myself in the daytime at the moment because my sleep's too important yeah well I know I used to run a gym and write oh, really? bodybuilding body oh, really? mags we've got so much in common like <laughs> yeah I know and this was this was back like 97 to 2000 I wish I'd known how to eat then because I'd have been got, well, got really ripped as well. But I kept doing endless cardio trying to burn fat off. I was not fat then. I was fine. But 
not I wanted to be really ripped. And the first time I ever got really ripped was eating tons and tons of fatty meat and lying on the sofa at like 50 years old and crippled with rheumatoid arthritis. And I thought something's wrong here. I'd figured out, you know, that oh, the whole cardio thing was nonsense. But now, I mean, yeah, I've, I've just started doing quite a bit again, but I just got I got really set back. I mean, there's many reasons, but I had, uh, you know, last not this summer gone, but the one before. And I was eating some crap stuff like chicken and and and, and dairy and pork and and eggs and stuff like that, which I don't do well on. No, I, I, I thought I thought I like the taste yeah. of pork, but I'll re, I, tr I treat it like a treat. And no, I'd never eat. I haven't eaten chicken for years. I mean, goose, 100 yeah. percent. I'm all in for goose, but chicken, no. And and pork is delicious. It's just. Yeah, uh, if I can eat pork belly every day, but it, it, it's gorgeous. But I can't I can't deal no, with it. But no, I got yeah. I really messed myself up. It was that and a load of other things going on and all sorts of. But it came to a perfect storm where I was in more pain last winter totally crippled legs wasted away i thought i'm this arthritis girl i can't walk without crutches i lost 45 pounds i was completely emaciated and and it took me about three months to get out of it but i messed up on loads of levels and and i totally crippled and still my knee is trashed you know you'll see i'll be walking on a wafty knee at this event and it's taking a lot of work i'll, I'll make I'm... sure to rugby tackle you then when i meet you <laughs> <laughs> no it's I think it's I think it's really like good for you to say that because it's sometimes, you know, we it's like exactly as you said, oh, you're meant to be this guru and now you're in agony. But we all yeah. like I've done really stupid things thinking it was a good idea, but that's how you help other people. And, you know, you're obviously out of it now with much better knowledge. Yeah, I learned loads. And I mean, I was really open about it. I went so I, I immediately got you know in touch with Anthony Chafee and said, you got a bigger reach than me. Let's let, let's go on and talk about this. You know, I'd love to go and talk about on about how I completely fucked up. And and yeah, I'm not I think there was all sorts of other weird influences there but on all levels. But it was a perfect storm of uh, starting off with a kidney stone. So there was obviously some oxalate things coming out as well after years and years of not having them you know and i had sally norton on the podcast recently and she said oh yeah can happen like decades later and whatever but it, yeah it was a horrific year uh, uh sort of the last winter and, and and into the early spring but yeah i knew what to do i knew what to sort out and on all, all the different levels and it was a fascinating journey but yeah so i am working out again now the legs are taking more rehab than uh than, than actually muscle building. And I miss those days where I was doing heavy 20 rep squats and writing about them in bodybuilding mags. That's not gonna happen for a while. Neither is sitting in Lotus, but you know, it's some interesting work to do and another interesting journey of not getting rid of inflammation, which is gone, but getting rid of um, uh, reversing damage, you know, because I've got, I managed to get, you know, all this, I was crippled with it all over and got it out of probably 30 joints with no damage, but then, you know, it's hit my left knee and since I probably had it bubbling away since the early 90s and I've got the movement back in the wrist that way. But that's the difference between the movement, you know, in one wrist okay. and the other. It, it does go for what's interesting. Yeah. I tend to see men get ankylosing spondylitis and women get rheumatoid arthritis. And yeah. I tend I don't very often see a man with rheumatoid so it's and it's obviously it's aggressive if if you're this young as well. So it's one of these things. I think it's, a, you know, I, I'm really feeling for you right now because I've seen my own clients with rheumatoid when it's really terrible and it's just an undescribable torment for, for a person to be in. Oh, my God, it is. It's horrendous. But, you know, it's it's fascinating now because I think, great. So the rest of my body's all right. Now I can see when I'd normally, I suppose somebody would go down and get a sinovectomy or get something ripped out. The cartilage is okay in there. It's not osteoarthritis, but to get that, you know, that knee straightened and get it bending properly and have some up. No, not me. I, I want to do a load of sort of biohacks on it and figure this out and figure that out and then be oh, able yeah, to definitely. fight about reversing joint damage. But at the moment, at the moment, it's annoying me. But but yeah, I am I am training again. And that's how I brought, you know, because I lost like 45 pounds and put on 30 back on, you know, so I, I've come back to what I should be, but without a little bit of fat that I did have. So I'm feeling great at the moment, except for that, that knee. And it's just like, this is funny, isn't it? 
it's almost like that's exciting. It's a new project. I've wrecked myself somewhere else and now I can figure that out. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's how I approach things. Yeah. That, you know, if I have a problem and I have to fix it, it's just I'm like, OK, whatever. Um, luckily, I don't have them very often. And ones I did have I were partly self-inflicted. But I think also it's just to approach things as a project. Also, it'd be very interesting of what Dr. Tom Cowan would make of you saying about autoimmunity and because you must know about his sort of views about viruses and immune systems don't exist. And I'm still trying to unpack this. So I, I did training with Tom and I finished now and, and a lot of it's really interesting, but some of it I'm still sort of, my little bi biology brain is sort of still trying to process the whole immunity or there isn't an immune system or the, there aren't viruses. Cause I'm open to anything. I just don't, I need to, to analyze it myself. But I think it's, again, watch this space and, and again, you know, with you and your full recovery. No, it's fascinating, isn't it? I got into this whole thing during the whole COVID nonsense. You know, it just does the immune system exist? Do viruses exist? Is it transmitted like a morphic resonance, like when women go into yeah. a it, house it, and, it, and, it, and have a period at the same time? You know, they coincide their periods and stuff or catching a yawn. I mean, oh yeah, exactly. It's like it's. It, it, I completely agree. Is is it a, is it generated by ele electromagnetism? Because in their book, The Invisible Rainbow, every time there's a big change in tech, there's a big pandemic. So so there's so many factors. Um, but we that would be for a whole other podcast because we've kind of been here for a while now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll wrap up now. But um, yeah, I can't wait. And if you know, if anybody's enjoyed this, I'm going to do an intro and blab about this anyway. But if anybody's listening to this before. January the 20th come and see Sarah completely uncensored at um at, at the war on health conference there'll be a link below and I, th I think it's going to be a lot of fun and it's not being recorded it's not being streamed so you know you're going to have to come along and hear the completely uncensored versions of people exactly I've, I've loved you know, talking you know I've loved I, I do hold back. We all hold back information online, even to our own clients. <laughs> but when it's like just a chat in the pub, all sorts will come out. So, yes. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I can't wait. There's going to be a whole room of completely enlightened people with talking testicles. Yes. Uh, it's going to be the business. Can't wait. Okay. So, so before we wrap up, thank you so much for doing that. But let people know where they can go and find you and see, because you've got some great interviews out there. If you just put, Sarah's name into YouTube or, or, or some podcasting platform or whatever, you'll find tons of fascinating talks. But where should they go to find out your personal? Um... Um, yeah, if you go to my YouTube channel, it's Busy Superhuman. Then I've got um, informative posts and uh, content, uh, lots on Instagram and then also TikTok. And TikTok's getting much more sensible now that it's uh, I can put informative videos up there, but sort of shorter form. But all my interviews and sort of educational little sort of 15 minute videos are all on my YouTube channel. And then you can just find me at Busy Superhuman. That's the handle for everything or, or Dr. Sarah Pugh. Well, that's fantastic. Sarah, thank you so much. And I can't wait to meet you in a couple of weeks. Yes, thank you, Phil. I've really enjoyed this. It's been uh, one of my favourite interviews. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Son of a lighthouse keeper Cars in a wishing well Prayed for a love to call